Buenos días. ¿Me pueden escuchar? Ah, gracias. Sí, estaba esperando la confirmación. Now, can you see my screen? Please tell me so I can start. Oh, oh, okay, I believe you are seeing my screen. So thank you for being here and welcome. My name is Pablo de Villeros. I'm a PhD student from Cienvestaf, Guadalajara and UPHF in France. And today I'm going to present very briefly uh, fully distributed federated learning using a zero grade and some algorithm. So welcome again and let's get started. Um, so as you saw before in, in, in the plenary lecture uh, yesterday by Dr. Ocampo, distributed optimization has, has become a very important topic in, in these days. Maybe during the last decade, there, there has been an explosion of algorithms and you can see many applications of distributed optimizations in smart grids, for example. That's the topic that Dr. Campo talked about uh, in social networks in robotic systems. And today I'm going to talk about uh, two particular subjects of machine learning, which are uh, regression and um, classification. So um, some, so, some basic concepts. The connectivity or the connection between agents can be modeled using graphs and sometimes due to problems, and this is very common in, in, in network systems, you may see some changes in the communication. That's what we call uh, dynamic networks or switching networks, as you can see on, on, on the right side of your screen. And we represent that by a set of a finite number of graphs and an external signal that switches uh, between these, these, these graphs or these topologies. Now, two important concepts as well. Uh, we say that a function, a twice differentiable function is strongly convex if it satisfies these two conditions here. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, yeah, if it satisfies these two conditions and if the function is strongly convex, we can guarantee that there is a unique optimal. So this is very convenient. And if this twice differentiable function is smooth, uh, it satisfies it satisfies these two conditions and we can guarantee that the gradient is Lipschitz continuous. Now, what is a zero gradient sum algorithm? So uh, an important assumption is, of course, that the, the local functions are strongly convex and smooth. So imagine we have these dynamics uh, for agent I, in the, and this agent has uh, a function, a Lipschitz function phi I, which is dependent on the in internal states of the agent, the information or the states coming from neighbors, and each agent is endowed with a particular local function, which is private to this agent. So it's not shared among, among the, the neighbors. So this is a very interesting Lyapunov function, which is very typical for these zero gradient sum algorithms. And as you can see, this Lyapunov function is quite similar to the definition to the, of the solely convex function. And we, as we can see, uh, this Lyapunov function is a, indeed a, a suitable Lyapunov function because it is positive, it's radially unbounded, and it's zero if and only if the states of the agents uh, converge to the optimum. X star is the optimum. And one, one more uh, feature about these Lyapunov functions is that they are independent of the topology. So we can apply them to um, uh, switching topologies or, or to dynamic networks. The time derivative of this Lyapunov function has this structure. And in order to be a zero gradient sum algorithm, it has to satisfy these three conditions. In particular, these last two conditions have a problem. And the first attempts of, um, of algorithms, of zero gradient sum algorithms, um, you have to have the, the initial condition of the agent start at the local minimum, which is very restrictive because we want to have a, um, 
an arbitrary initial condition. And the second problem is that this phi function is normally designed uh, using the inverse of the Hessian to cancel this one. And for high ordered uh, systems, these Hessians can be huge, can be very large, especially if we're talking about machine learning problems in which we have hundreds, um, thousands of, of data. So the Hessians can be very large and computing the inverse of that of those Hessians. And especially if they are time dependent, that's very complicated. So we have to address these two problems, and, and I will in a moment. So very quickly, the problem formulation. Imagine we have a first order system. Each agent has these first order, order dynamics in which theta i is the, the state of the agent. But in this context, the state is the local estimation of the global model parameters. But uh, in the end, what we want to do is to find some global model, uh, global model parameters. And theta i is the estimation that each agent has of those global parameters. And this is, of course, the local quantum input. Um, two assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that the dynamic network is composed of undirected connected graphs. And secondly, that, of course, and I mentioned that before, each function, with which I insist that they are private to each uh, agent, these functions are not shared, must be twice differentiable, strongly convex, and smooth. So in the end, what we want is to minimize the sum of all those functions and guarantee that each agent uh, converges to the global optimum when, the, when time goes to infinity. Okay. Very good. So two examples about machine learning problems. These are very common uh, uh, problems. The first one is uh, regression, and we wanted to, to perform quadratic regression using, um, using least squares. And um, imagine we want to, um, to find these three parameters, theta 2, theta 1, and theta 0. So this is the global parameter vector. And we want to do this in a distributed manner. So for each agent, we define an observation uh, vector and an input matrix, uh, which is local. So each agent with their own data set um, have, has this um, vector and matrix. And with this, we can formulate this local function. I will explain a little bit the terms in a moment. For classification, we are interested in finding uh, the parameters W and B, where W is the, um, the weights vector, and W1 and W2, and B is the bias. That's what is called in the literature. So we want to find this um, hyperplane separating line. In this, kind, in this context, it's only a line because we are talking about uh, 2D. Uh, so, if a new data comes, if uh, after replacing here it is bigger than zero, higher than zero, we say that that data, that point, belongs to class one or class A, whatever you want to call it. But uh, numerically, we assign a label, let's say CK equals one. Now, if that data, after replacing the equation in the separating line, is uh, smaller than zero, so that, that data, that point belongs to the other class, let's say class zero or class B, but numerically it's better to call that uh, as um, CK equals minus, minus one. That's, those are the labels, one and minus one. And the local functions are defined like this. I know it's a little bit messy, but uh, due to the, the limitation in time, I, I, don't, I, I, I can't explain every detail. But this comes from a um, primal dual formulation of the of the problem. But maybe it's important to um, to mention two two features, so two two things. The first one is this L Y L I parameter. Actually, it's the number of observations for each agent. So one of you may call it uh, a statistical units, and this is important because each agent must can have uh, different numbers of observations at least one observation, of course. And this second 
term here that is present in both expressions for regression and classification is what we call regularization term. And it has two objectives. The first one is to um, um, avoid overfitting, which is a common problem in machine learning pro uh, uh, standard problems, and to ensure or to guarantee that the functions are strongly convex, which is a requirement. It's it's uh, we need all, all functions to be strongly convex. Okay, so beta is a is a is a number bigger than zero. Okay, let's move on. This is the 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 algorithm we developed, and it's inspired by some authors. And especially if you see the, the structure of this algorithm is, is kind of similar to the integral sliding modes for those who, who knows about sliding modes. And especially we have uh, two, two terms here that I want to, to bring the attention to. The first term forces the system to achieve the zero gradient sum manifold. This is a very important thing that we have to guarantee that agents achieve this manifold and um, from this manifold, they move towards the global optimum. And this is done uh, from any initial condition. That's that's one of the important things I want to to, to show that you, you may start whatever you want, but um, in, a, in a finite time, the agents will um, achieve the zero gradient sum manifold. And in parallel, this other term forces the system to reach consensus uh, toward the global minimum, optimum, okay? Or minimum, we are talking about a minimum. And this is a fully distributed algorithm. Uh, the information that we need, it's only internal information or, in, or information coming from agents, neighboring agents. Okay, let's move on. So for the simulations, we consider uh, 10 agents and four topologies. So uh, the topologies will be changing among these four. Each agent, without any loss of generality, has uh, 50 training samples, but it could be any number. So we have a total of 500 uh, training samples. That's the total. For the regression part, we are distributing these, these data points, so these training samples, along this parabola, and we add some, some noise, Gaussian noise. And for the classification, we are distributing these uh, uh, training samples on both sides of this line, and we um, we make some points to be misclassified uh, randomly, so we we can see if the if if this algorithm works fine even with misclassified points. When I say misclassified points, is that uh, we may have some points that have a, an erroneous label, so instead of being one, it is minus one, etc. And we are using MATLAB uh, Simulink with an Euler solver and step size of one to the minus four. So these are the results, very quick. Uh, for, for regression, uh, then the green dots represent the, the training data. And we see that the, the black dotted line, which is a centralized algorithm, we, actually we can um, perform a, a linear algebra deduction to, to find a centralized algorithm. It's not very complicated. We we find this um, this parabola, and our distributed algorithm is all, almost overimposed. So it's and if you analyze the um, root mean square error, it's practically the same. So we can conclude that our algorithm, our distributed algorithm, works fine in comparison with a centralized algorithm. And on the right, you can see how um, the parameters. Uh, converge to the optimum. Each agent starts at any random position, and after a certain time, they converge to the uh, to the optimum. Even during the switchings of the topology, here we see how the the topology changes every 0 0.5, 0 0.05 units of time. And of course, we are guaranteeing that the zero gradient sum property is is fulfilled. And for classification. Uh, the, we have two families, two, two, two classes. Uh, we have the green triangles and the blue circles. And as you may see, we have some misclassifications here, 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 etc. But even though 
um, the distributed algorithm using support vector machines works fine. It's almost overimposed as well uh, over a centralized algorithm uh, that we use in MATLAB. And the centralized algorithm, is, it's a function. It's fit C linear function if, for those who, who knows about this. And on the right, we decided to start randomly at zero, uh, but the agents um, converge to the global optimal after a certain amount of time, even during the switchings. And of course, the, um, the zero gradient sum property is fulfilled. Okay, some conclusions. I'm sorry for speaking so fast, but you know that time's gold. So, um, Conclusions, the proposed algorithm has proven satisfactory in reaching the global optimum um, under uh, dynamic networks, which is a common issue uh, uh, in, in, in networks. The proposed scheme is Hessian free, and this is very important, uh, as I told you before. Uh, and, and this feature drastically improves the performance when data sets are large. That's, that's the whole idea. And one important characteristic uh, is that uh, yet agents do not have to share the, the local functions or gradients or even raw data, reducing the communication burden and, of course, if needed, preserving the privacy. And in the future, we want to examine super vector machines with other kernels so we can tackle, we can handle some more intricate data patterns and the inclusion of equality and inequality constraints. So that's it. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you had any, any question, I'm happy to, to answer it. Vamos a pasar a la siguiente presentación. Okay. Okay, very good. Thank you. The next talk of the of this session is by uh, is a servo motor parameter identification using the Kalman filter with model reference estimator. Uh, the talk is going is uh, going to be presented by Oscar Gonzalez Miranda. Hello everyone, my name is Oscar, and I am going to talk about a uh, parameter identification method. Uh, use it to characterize a uh, servo motor. Okay, uh, this is the content that I prepared for you. Uh, I am going to describe our method. Uh, then I am going to talk about the dual canon filter. Uh, this is a similar method. And I am comparing them using experimental results. Uh, at the end, I will give you a conclusions. Uh, the method proposed use a Kalman filter. Uh, this is important because uh, usually we don't have all the states. Uh, we don't measure all the states when we want to characterize a plant. Uh, with our method, uh, we use the Kalman filter as an observer and we use the states to identify the, the parameters of the servo motor. Uh, almost uh, methods uh, need all the states to uh, identify the values of a plan. Uh, particularly in this uh, problem, uh, we consider a constant disturbance and we identify and use this information uh, to get uh, better results. I will talk about it. And I am going to show you uh, experimental results uh, with this method. Okay, 
Uh, usually, the MAC model of a servo motor is this, uh, the question one. Uh, this model considers the viscous friction, the Coulomb friction. Uh, it supposed that the servo motor use a peak controller. Uh, B is a scale factor, and D is a constant disturbance. Uh, the, this equation can uh, rewrite as a um, state equation, and we can see that we only measure uh, one state, the angular position. Uh, uh, next, please. Okay. Uh, we use the Kalman filter uh, in first two blocks. Uh, we can see that the extrapolation equation is the discrete form of the last state equation. And uh, the method uh, calculates the next value of the states, the next value of the covariance matri matrix, and use the new data the new measurements to update these values. Uh, in our method, we add this third block, the model update. Uh, the third equation of the block is a predictor. Uh, this equation is a math model to uh, calculate the value of data. And we define the prediction error. Uh, from the Japan of analysis of this math model, uh, we get the adaptive law, uh, data hat dot. And, and that equation led us to know the value of the parameters in each iteration. Uh, with DC values, we update. Uh, F, B, and W uh, matrix for the next step. Uh, and we can uh, see that the extrapolation equation uh, include uh, the process noise. This is important because usually uh, that is a unknown matrix and it is ignored ignored uh, during the extrapolation. But with this method, we can uh, estimate it. Ah, next, please. Now, uh, to compile our method uh, with another similar, uh, we implement a dual Kalman filter. Uh, the dual Kalman filter use a second Kalman filter to estimate the value of the parameters. And to apply it, uh, we can re, uh, we need to rewrite the equation one uh, as there. Um, the dual kernel filter led us to estimate at the same time the states and the parameters of the plan. Uh, next, please. Okay, this is the servo motor that we want to characterize. It's a it is a low cost servo motor from Adafruit, and it is used to stir a car like robot. In some experiments, uh, we put the car on the floor and it follows its lane. Uh, this is the form, it is the form that we have to change the chart on the servo. And I am going to show you experimental results uh, with this robot. Next, please. Okay. Uh, to initialize, initialize the parameters, uh, we put the car on the floor, static, and we apply it a symmetric step. Uh, in blue is the input, in red is the output of the servo motor. Uh, they don't have the same scale, and the units of the vertical axis are relatives. And the yellow uh, line 
is the output calculated using a critically damped second uh, a second order critically damped system. Uh, we do it because it's easy to fit the that output with the experimental results. Uh, so uh, with this, we get a initial value of the parameters. Next, please. Now, uh, to get the convergence of the parameters, we need an input signal with a property called a persistent excitation. This means that we need a signal with a, with a bandwidth sufficiently, sufficiently rich uh, to excite all the modes of the system, but abiding the high frequencies because these are associated to non-modeled dynamics. And a signal uh, with this property is the state is is the are the states of the diffin oscillator. Uh, this is the diffin oscillator that we use, and uh, in black is the input. And with this input signal, we apply it uh, the all method and the dual Kalman filter method. Uh, this experiment were done. No, uh, the, uh, that experiment was done uh, with the car on the floor and static. And next, please. Now, uh, this graph shows the convergence of each parameter. Uh, it is using uh, our proposed method. Uh, it, ta it takes all the data obtained uh, during the experiment. And next, please. And these graphs uh, are the parameter convergence using the dual Kalman filter. We can observe that the dual Kalman filter uh, converts faster. Uh, it takes less, uh, less than a second. However, uh, with our method, uh, we get a better experimental results. Next, please. Uh, this table shows us uh, the ISE and the RMSE uh, of the outputs using the dual Kalman filter and our method. And we can observe that in the experiments where, uh, where the car was following its lane at different velocities, uh, we get better results. Only during the first experiment with the Dufin oscillator input, uh, the dual Kalman filter uh, gets a better result, but that is because it converts faster. Uh, next, please. And uh, these are uh, examples of the fitting. Uh, in the experiments where the car was in movement. We can observe that the output in red, the, the output measured using the servo, and the output calculated using the math model, obtained it with our method, uh, but uh, uh, has but uh, have a good fit. Uh, next, please. And these results uh, were obtained with the dual Kalman filter. Uh, we get a better fit uh, with our method. Uh, next, please. Uh, well, uh, our conclusion is that we proposed a method to identify the parameters of a servo motor. Uh, this method used the Kalman filter and it is combined with a model reference estimator. And in this problem, 
uh, considering a, a constant disturbance, uh, we can get the process noise. Uh, usually it is a known matrix, but we could uh, get it and use it to get better extrapolation during the Kalman algorithm. And we compare it uh, with the dual Kalman filter and get better results. And that is all. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Question Okay, what's the originality of the contribution? Uh, basically, uh, we propose another method to identify the parameters. The uh, Kalman filter? Uh, using a Kalman filter and a uh, uh, model reference estimator uh, because. But these are not new. Uh, we combine it uh, because. Combining is not a new contribution. Uh, add a block to the algorithm. Uh, but, but yes, uh, I know that uh, it is some um, very, very relevant, but it. Uh, the application? The application was that uh, we can measure all the states of the system in some experiments. Uh, in this case, we only measure the angular position, but the parameter identification method needs all the states, usually, need all the states uh, to apply them. And in this case, we, we use the Kalman filter to observe uh, the states that we don't measure. And in this case, we could uh, get the value of the processing noise. Uh, during the Kalman filter, uh, this matrix is ignored, is unknown. But with this method, we get it and use it in the Kalman filter algorithm. Thank you. Maybe sign your presentation. Well, it's still 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Last presentation, John Lang. Oh, no. John is here. Start at 9 10. We have to follow the schedule or we can start the live presentation. I think we can begin. Okay. That's good. Encourage Okay, well, the next uh, presentation uh, is about preliminary experiment, experiments with a PI controller for cutting tissue is an electrosurgery unit, and uh, the results are going to be presented by, by Bruno Gutierrez Chavez. Please start. Thank you for the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the last the, the work we did in the last year, which are the type of preliminary experiments with a PI controller for current tissue with an electrosurgery unit. This work was done with the help of my colleague Jonathan Muñoz and also the professors Ramirez Vargas, Mera Mora, and Flores Ramirez. And part of this work is also the results of my, my medical engineering bachelor thesis. The content we'll be reviewing today consists in first time introduction about what is electrosurgery, then the main contribution of our work, our system description, the results, the conclusions, and finally our references. Here in these pictures, I want to show you the results of our ESU proposed device. Here we can also see the cut of a tissue with our proposed unit. 
And also in the oscilloscope, we can see some of the signals that our EHU produces, which is a high frequency, high voltage um, signal in order to produce the power that cuts the, the tissue. And I also want you to look at some of the results, some of the tests we did the last year. And here we are cutting in cattle and chicken breast. And I want you to look at the, that the microsurgical pencil is in fact cutting the, the chicken tissue, which is what we expect. Let's begin with breast electrosurgery. In this case, an electrosurgical unit is a device that produces high frequency currents and also applies a high voltage to the tissue in order to cause coagulation, desiccation, fulguration, and cutting. The procedure basically consists of an active electrode which, which hands the surgeon in order to close the circuit of the patient and then produce a current that hits the tissue and then achieves one of the effects listed before. Uh, this is also a electrosurgical unit, a commercial electrosurgical unit made by the plant of Orion. And what I want to look is that the electrosurgical unit has a selector for the power level of the of the cut or coagulation in this case. The, the, these electrosurgical units are used in, mo in more than 80% of surgical procedures because its main advantage is that it minimizes bleeding and also reduces the risk of infection when compared to the traditional scalping. In order to not stimulate muscle and nerves and not cause pain, the, the frequency that these devices use uh, are between the range in 100 kilohertz and 4 megahertz. And also it uses a voltage in the range of the of 100 volts to 2,000 volts. Armist. The effect the, the effect we want can be achieved by changing the waveform. In this case, the two main operating modes in an electrosurgical unit are the cutting and the coagulation. In this case, for cutting, uh, the electrosurgical units use a, sinu a continuous sinusoidal waveform and in order to cause the most um, heat and then cut the tissue. And on the other hand, for coagulating tissue, the waveform is an intermittent higher voltage in sinusoidal waveform in order to produce less heat and form a clot. In this case, our work focuses mainly on focuses on the cutting task. One of the main problems that electrosurgical units, commercial electrosurgical units have, is that they operate in an open loop. By, the, by this I mean that the, the surgeon selects the power level they, he, he wants in the, at the output, but the device doesn't, doesn't really measures the output. So the behavior that we observe when when using these devices is the one in this graph, which is that the if um, reference level of 50 watts is selected by the surgeon, in reality, the real output power is less than the, the expected. In this case, for, for, for teaching impedances lower than 500 ohms and higher than a thousand ohms, we can see that the the real output power is less than the expected uh, power. So uh, this is because the tissue has uh, a varying impedance depending on the anisotropy, temperature, humidity, frequency, and other um, other properties of the environment of the tissue. So our main contribution focuses on the fact that we want to, to close a loop in order to regulate the power, which, in order to compensate these changes in impedance. Our main contribution 
is that we propose a simplified electrosurgical unit design, which is composed by a buck converter and also a push pull inverter, uh, which is able to cut the animal tissue. And our experiments reveal that the closed loop scheme to regulate power improves the cut task of our ESU. Our system description, with respect to the system description, our system basically composes of a buck converter and a push pull inverter. In this case, our buck converter is drive by a, a put weight modulation signal, which has a frequency of 2.5 kilohertz. And our push pull inverter has um, a boundary signal of a square, which is a square weight of, uh, of 2,200 kilohertz. And the main reason of why we want a pull inverter is because it allows us to change the frequency by varying the frequency of the, of the square weight. And also the transformer um, gives us uh, the opportunity to amplify the the amplitude of our signal. Talking more about what is a back converter and a push pull inverter, here is the simplified circuit of a back converter. This is a DC to DC converter, which means that by altering the duty cycle or the time the switch is closed, with respect to the time the switch is open, we can vary the output level of the voltage. And with the push pull inverter, we can change the DC signal to an AC signal and also amplify the, the amplitude. I also present to you the average model of the converter and the simplified model of the push pull inverter, which were used for the simulations in order to calculate the best in order to calculate the best values of the components for the real circuit. Our control loop system consists basically in our ESU, which is composed by a 24 volt power source, our port converter, a push pull inverter, and the tissue, which is the load, and also a proposed RMF power measurement circuit, which produces the signal to the PI controller in order to, to control the, the, out, the RMS output power applied to the tissue. The RMS power measurement circuit basically consists of two sensors, a voltage sensor and a current sensor, which both produces a voltage signal pro proportional to those signals. Then these signals are multiplied in order to obtain a voltage proportional to the instantaneous power. And then a true RMS to DC converter is used in order to obtain a voltage proportional to the RMS power. To the PI controller tuning. We use some of the results we obtained in our previous work. And we we'll conclude that the MIGO formula were the best, gave the best result for our tuning. In this case, we use we use them and also we obtain the open loop response in order to calculate the static gain, the time delay, and the lag time of the of our system and then calculate the, the proportional and integral gains, which are those numbers. Our experimental platform, again, consists of a power source, our ESU, which is a buck converter and an inverter, our tissue, in this case, our active electrode and our return plate closes the circuit with the tissue in order to energize it and cut it. And then the, we measure the voltage and current signals through the tissue and apply to the tissue with our RMS power measurement circuit board. We read the data with uh, the acquisition cards from national instruments and then implement the AI controller with a computer. And finally, the Arduino Mega has the, the purpose of producing the, the PWM signal, which is the buck cover. With respect to the results, this is a, a screenshot of the oscilloscope of the output signal. In this case, our, our ESU um, outputted a voltage in the range of 2,200 volts to 960 volts with an output frequency 
in between uh, 100 kilohertz and 300 kilohertz, and an output RMS power between 10 watts and 90 watts. On the right side of the screen, you can also see the blue line is the voltage applied to the tissue converted to voltage by a, by a voltage sensor. And also in the red line, you can see the current signal converted to voltage by our current sensor. Here I present to you some of the tests of our control loop system when, when coding tissue. And I also want you to look at the oscilloscope. The yellow line is the, the voltage signal converted to voltage by our voltage, our voltage sensor. And the blue line is the current of the signal. And in this case, we, the relevant Information is the our signal remains sinusoidal while the tissue. This is also our open loop response of our ESU, our electrosurgical device. We in which I want you to look at the cuts of uh, in this case the PWM was fixed at fifty percent, sixty percent, seventy percent, and eighty percent. And the results of the output RMS power applied to the tissue are presented in those graphs. In this case, we can see that there is no linear correlation between the RMS output power and the time. And also that the power is clearly not regulated. With respect to the results of our closed loop response, in this case, the we made cuts of 50, 60, 70, and 80 watts of reference, and you can see that the quality of the cuts improves with respect to the open loop cuts. And also in the graphs on the right side of the screen, you can see that the output RMS power is regulated. In this case, the blue line is a uh, uh, 1.1 kilo ohm load. And then the red line is the time when we just connect this load and proceed to cut the tissue. And as you can see, the, the power is regulated when the tissue is being cut. And here I present to you uh, a video of the cut. In this case, we are cutting muscle, but there is also the presence of fat tissue and the control algorithm still works. We, even though there is the presence of that tissue, which obviously changes the, the impedance of the tissue. And another can be main. And also, you, you can identify the return plate, which is the aluminum foil mm. platform. And also, the performance of the PI controller regulating the power. Finally, these are. These are other cuts using higher higher powers power in the case 25 80, 85 85 watts and the you can also see another uh, graph of the of the power control but this time using a reference of 85 watts in this case the blue line is again our 1.1 kilo ohm load and the red line represents the, the disconnection of that load and the connection of the tissue while cutting. And you can also see that the, the PI controller still regulates the power at the reference value we want. Finally, our conclusion is that the model of a simplified ESU as you composed by a back converter and a push pull inverter, experimentally demonstrated the effective performance of cutting tissue. And also, it supplies a stable sinusoidal signal ranging from frequencies from uh, 100 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz with a power output between 10 and 90 watts RMS. Also, that utilizing a PI controller, the close design of our ESU. It regulates the RMS power signal. And also, this design measures the RMS power passing through the tissue. 
uh, as the output, while the control variable is the pulse width of the switching signal in the vacuum converter. Mm -hmm. Another conclusion is that experimental results show a significant improvement in the tissue when compared to the same device occurring in an open loop. And also, the design and experiments indicate that the for, that for enhance, enhancements to the ESU can be made in order to implement a closed loop scheme for cutting, desiccating, fibrillating, and coagulating the tissue. These are some of the reference using the, for this work, mainly the work I did in my biomedical engineering bachelor's thesis. And thank you for your attention. Are there some questions? Yeah, I have a one. Uh, hi, why do you use a PI control and why, do, why don't you use uh, another control like PAB or CTC, uh, or try to compare between one control or another. We use a, we decided to use a PI controller because we know from a previous result that the PI is, is sufficient in order to compensate the, these changes in impedance. And also, a lot of the time, invest in this work was mainly con uh, focused in the creation of the device because it's really hard to cut tissue. And that's why we decided to start with only a PI control. Thanks. Another question? Uh, <coughs> is there a uh, type of medical regulation for DC types of, of circuits? Uh, currently, no. In fact, that's, that is why we, we propose this scheme because for commercial electrosolical uh, units, actually, uh, actually don't, don't have this system of power regulation. Okay. And are, are you able to compare this uh, tool with uh, Commercial uh, available uh, electro uh, cutting tools? Not yet because we don't have access to the cart and we can alter the cart of an electrosurgical unit. But you can compare the results, cutting mm. results, something like that. Mm. Yes, <laughs> well, we haven't done that yet. But it could be done. And, and uh, have you seen some electrosurgical tools uh, functioning? Yes, I I work at a hospital. So, so you have some experience. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Just watching them now. So, yeah. yeah, watching. Yeah. But what do you think compared to this tool? Do you have some, do you think this has future? Do you think the, the current yeah. commercial tool look, work as well? Yeah, I think this has a lot of people because one of the problems of that there is no power regulation is that the surgeon might want to cut. Uh, but usually the surgeon knows what he's cutting, hopefully. Yes, but <laughs> yes, but the problem is that as the impedance changes from the conditions of and bonds, and bonds also the bonds. I don't know if electricity can cut bonds. No, no, but no. there is bond inter interference. Maybe the mm -hmm. bonds also uh, interferes with the impedance. Yes, and what I want to say is that the main problem of not having a real power output regulation is that the surgeon might want to cut, I don't know, the, the arm. But he knows that he needs 50 watts, for example. But with the change of impedance, I mean, maybe he's a, a person, a skinny person, and then it's different, the, the real output voltage um, than when compared to a normal person. And then with this, the power may be less, and then the surgeon might want to compensate that by increasing the, the output level in the electrostatic unit, but then what happens if the impedance changes again, 
and the 80 watts he selected rises to 100 watts, then the, there might be a risk of burning the, the patient. All right, well, no, no more questions? Okay, we sign the speaker. Thank you. Well, the session as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.